Hello. Welcome back to Learn It From a Layman. I am Carl Christensen, and I'm back with Matt Christensen and nobody else. So, uh, in light of the fact that we have our most uh, scientifically minded podcast host back, we're going to tackle vision and fusion this week. So that's going to be the subject of our podcast. We're going to talk a little bit uh, about well, just what the reactions are, the energy produced, and uh, kind of the implications of fission and fusion. So uh, let's uh, let's kick it off. Matt, do you have uh, any words of wisdom to start off with about fission? Well, yeah, just a disclaimer that the most scientifically minded amongst this group is a pretty low bar. So... <laughs> Uh, that's correct. It's uh, a remarkably low bar. So two, two. Well, let's see. I'm not entirely sure what Cameron's uh, major fell under, but um, it certainly wasn't a uh, mathematical science. And I know that uh, Tim and I majored in uh, humanities, and uh, Johnny is a doctor, as we've mentioned before. So yeah, and doctors don't do science. <laughs> I don't know a little bit. No, okay. Well, a different a biological science or chemical science, not so much on the uh, physics and chemistry and uh, I just said chemistry, didn't I? Well, I disregard that. Yeah, All right. Well, doctors never use chemistry for anything. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, so. All uh, right. Anyway. Yeah. Fusion okay. And let's start. Fusion. Yes, let's start with, so I was going to start with fission, and um, I guess I want uh, listeners to understand, so uh, from a very lay perspective, which is what I need to start with, is fission and fusion are different things, Um, and so let's start, Matt, tell us uh, just a tiny bit about fission. Okay, so when when we talk overall about nuclear reactions, we're talking about the reactions that involve a nucleus, that's the word nuclear it's pronounced nuclear with reference or to nuclear. No, it is not because, as I said, it's talking about a nucleus, not a nucleus. And if you hear somebody say nucleus or nuclear, <laughs> this podcast is granting you permission to gently correct that person using whatever <laughs> blunt instruments happen to be at hand. Um, I'm not sure we can give that permission. (laughs) No, no, we actually can't. And you definitely should not assault someone physically for using the wrong term. So just emotionally and mentally? Yeah, just give them a disappointed look. Um, (laughs) Anyway, nuclear reactions having to do with the nucleus of an atom. And specifically, we're talking about uh, either splitting that nucleus or smushing two nuclei, nucleuses, haha, together. Uh, and when we talk about fission and fusion, that's what we're talking about, those two different types of nuclear reactions, either splitting an atom or combining two atoms. So fission is the splitting of an atom. And generally, when we talk about a fission reaction, we're talking about a large atom because those are easy to split. And so if you look at your periodic table of the elements, all of those big things down toward the bottom with high uh, atomic numbers like plutonium and uranium and all those other things, thorium, those are fairly large atoms and they're fairly easy to split, to break, to shatter their nuclei, their nucleuses. So when we're talking about a fission reaction, we're talking about taking a large atom and smacking it really hard such that it breaks and forms two smaller atoms. Fusion, on the other hand, uh, we do with small atoms. We do th- with th- things like uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen is, is just a single proton, normally. Um, and you, if you, you take a hydrogen atom and another hydrogen atom and you manage to smash them together, they form a different atom through fusion. Uh, the fusion implying that the nucleus fuses with another nucleus. Fusion. There you go. Uh, so that's what we're talking about when we talk about these nuclear reactions. Fission, splitting a big atom apart. Fusion, smushing two small atoms together. 
you already mentioned so in fission generally you said large atoms so you, um uh, my understanding generally is it's uranium and plutonium right uh yeah thorium is kind of coming into vogue in a lot of parts of the world um okay so which of those elements so do different uh, maybe this is a question beyond what you are know but which of those uh do larger atoms uh, when you do a fission reaction on a larger atom, does it pr produce more energy? Well, uh, I, I don't know that I could say. There's there's um, a whole bunch of different fuels that you can use and a whole bunch of different reactions that you can generate with those different fuels. And the amount of energy that is released in each reaction depends on the fuel, the environment, the, how you split it, all these all these things. Uh, and um, in in order to really make sense of it, you need uh, a, a at least a basic understanding of of, of chemistry and chemical reactions, um, and then you need quite a bit more advanced understanding of uh, how energy and and mass relate to each other, and that whole E equals M C squared thing comes into play, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but you do have uh, you can look it up, uh, and, and I think it's a bit further than we want to go into this podcast, but you can look up the many different types of fission reactions that are commercially used uh, and the amount of energy per chunk of fuel that you get from it. Um, but in, in even the individual elements, they all have, there, there's different forms the, the non-layman word is isotopes of those elements. So, for example, you can have plutonium-239, which is a plutonium atom with 239 protons and neutrons and stuff in it. Or you can have plutonium-241, which has two additional neutrons, or 240, uh, or, or any of these other things. They all provide slightly different reactions that will provide slightly different energy outputs and that are more and less difficult to achieve or control or clean up or, or all of these things. So uh, I, I'm not equipped to answer, you know, which, which fuel is the best in terms of energy. Um, but for the layman that wants to look it up, there, there are tables. It, the selection of an appropriate nuclear fuel goes beyond just what is what has the best energy. There's um, right. the ease of control. There's the safety, yeah. uh, both during the reaction and and in disposing of the the byproducts after, and and so on and so forth. Yeah, you're right. As far as the selection of nuclear fuel, did I say oh, nuclear? yeah, that's there you go. one. <laughs> Correct me. <laughs> nuclear fuel, I'm sure, is multifaceted and beyond uh, the, uh, a layman such as myself to comment necessarily on meaningfully. However, it is the case that um, there are, uh, you know, so we have nuclear fission, nu whatever. I'm just going to say it how I two. say it. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, when you get to strike three, nothing actually happens. So oh, Okay, good. On. Good. Anyway, I'm giving it, you a disapproving glance through my webcam. <laughs> regardless of the energy fuel that the, the fuel that you select for your fission plant, for your nuclear uh, fish, fission plant, um, uh, there's a massive amounts of energy produced, right? The, the yes. energy produced in, in these nuclear um, nuclear. Well, that's why I said that time. I think it isn't, but you can check the playback. <laughs> Go, go to replay on this one. Yeah, anyway. Uh, challenging. Okay. Um, uh, massive amounts of energy produced. And that's that's the big thing about a nuclear energy in general is that um, that the amount of energy produced is is massive. Yes. So, uh, so where does the energy come from? Yeah. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, and when we're talking about fission... Um, well, okay, when, when we're talking about fission or fusion, uh, a lot of the energy comes from breaking uh, or, or forging or restructuring the, uh, the bonds within the nucleus between the, the protons, the neutrons, and so forth. 
Uh, and it it comes down to some of the four fundamental forces, which I really don't want to get into because I don't understand them. Um, but basically, when you restructure those bonds, a large amount of energy is released. Um, now, in some cases, the there there is actually a conversion of subatomic particles, neutrons or or, or electrons or whatever from mass, from matter, from a particle, into pure energy. And uh, I, I mentioned that E equals mc squared equation, well, or equation. Um, that equation basically states that mass and energy are equivalent. They can move from one form to another. And uh, they, they do so according to that equation. E equals mc squared. Uh, again, is the E is energy. It's the amount of energy in a thing. The amount of energy in a thing equals M, which is your mass, times C squared, C being the speed of light. Uh, the speed of light squared is a large number. If you multiply that times your mass, you're going to get a big number. So your energy of any given wad of material is the mass of that wad of material times the speed of light squared. That's a lot of energy. When mass changes into energy, it, it's a big, big number. And so you, think, you find that in some of these nuclear reactions. Small bits of, of mass become energy, and the output is huge. Uh, the nuclear weapon that we dropped on, on Japan in World War II, something like... Um, I can't remember if it was 7 or 0.7, but it was some really small number of, of, of grams of matter became energy. And the, you know, that was part of that massive energetic explosion event. Um, when mass becomes energy, that's huge. And that's what, that's the dark magic that you start to get into when you talk about nuclear reactions. So it's, it's a combination of, of, breaking or, or resetting or forging new bonds between protons and neutrons inside a nucleus, as well as the conversion of products of that reaction, uh, neutrons, etc., cetera, um, from matter into energy. Yeah, so uh, yeah, there's a lot. You just said a mouthful. but Yeah, I, I'm reminded of that... Uh, that scene in Pirates of the Caribbean where uh, <laughs> Kira Knightley asks for the cessation of hostilities against Port Royal. The guy says, there's a lot of big words there. We're not but humble pirates. <laughs> well, it turns out that humble pirates don't do nuclear physics very well, so we are going to use a lot of big words. Yes. And then Barbosa immediately says, I'm disinclined to acquiesce to your proposal, and it's awesome. <laughs> but maybe pirates can do physics. Anyway, go, yeah, let's... Uh, well, I was going to say, so so with the, 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 the creation of the energy from from these n nuclear reactions that you're talking about... The, reactions, yeah. Whatever. It's a small one, um, but it's an important one to get right. Well, is it? Um, <laughs> I think I've proved very clearly that it's not. I, uh, go for it. Anyway, um, I, as far as... Um, Fission versus fusion, I guess, in this case, um, fusion still provides a significant higher amount of energy than fission. Right? Uh, well, OK, I mean, yes, sort of. Um, so when, when we talk about fission and fusion and the reason that one is better than the other, there's a number of factors. And it's not as simple as this one gives more energy. Um, right. But at the but fundamental does, right? level. A fissile nuclear reaction will produce more energy per reaction than a fusion reaction. So if I take two hydrogen atoms and I smush them together in a basic fusion reaction, I will get a bit of energy out of it. Neat. If I take a plutonium atom and I shatter it, I'm going to get a larger amount of energy out of that. Um, and that's cool. The thing is, uh, fusion reactions will generally occur at a much greater rate 
And so for each plutonium atom that I split and I get a large wad of energy out of it, I'm going to be able to fuse a greater number of hydrogen atoms together. And, and so it turns out that in theory, um, a, a fusion reaction could generate, not reaction, but a fusion device could generate more energy than a, you know, than a, a, a similarly complex fissile device or, or fission device. Uh, so where, where you see this really illustrated, as with all things, um, is bombs. Uh, when we talk nuclear weapons, uh, we're, we're talking about weapons that use either a fission or a fusion reaction or a combination of both to create their blast. The very first bombs, the only ones that we've ever used in anger, the atom bombs, were fission bombs. They used plutonium or uranium or so. I don't even know what they used. They used some large atoms and they split them in half and, and that was that. Um, Shortly after this, we figured out how to make fusion bombs, and those were exponentially more powerful uh, than, than an equivalently physically sized fission bomb. Uh, and in fact, you know, there were some of these where, uh, at the beginning, where the reactions were not quite as well understood as, as they thought they were. Um, there was a famous nuclear test called Castle Bravo, which was supposed to be a, what, like a, a three megaton event. Three megatons is, is equivalent to three million tons of, of TNT. That's a big explosion. Well, it turned out when they, they lit that thing off, it ended up being a 15 megaton event. Uh, that's pretty big. Um, and that was, uh, that was a, uh, essentially a fusion powered bomb. It was actually a combination of fission and fusion, but the, the, the key component to the blast was, was a fission-created fusion reaction. So anyway. Fission, okay. Yep. So, um, okay, that, so that's, for... that's kind of the difference in terms of power generation. Uh, okay. Fission, you get more power per event. Fusion, you get more events. At, in the same amount of time, and so you can get more power theoretically out of a fusion device. Okay. The layman understanding of fission uh, right now, um, so fission is what powers all of our nuclear plants right now. Uh, yes. We don't, right, we don't have the ability to control nuclear reactions. Be a, a sustained, we cannot control a sustained nuclear reaction and harness the energy from it right now at all uh, new no, because it one it's nuclear two it's <clears throat> a nuclear fusion reaction what did um, that say? just you uh you said nuclear reactions in general oh uh, nuclear fusion we cannot yeah. control nuclear fusion reactions. correct so a, a nuclear fusion reaction so far the only ones that we have been able to sustain have um They've had a net uh, consumption of power in order to keep them going. So we, we've managed to build fusion devices that generate fusion reactions. But in order to power that device, I need to consume 100 watts in order to generate 30 watts. So that's cool that I can do that, but that doesn't really, that's not a successful doesn't business help. model for your power company. All right. Um, the only devices where we've managed to get a net increase in energy have been, well, the bombs. And those are not sustained fusion reactions. Uh, fission reactions, on the other hand, yeah, we figured that out. We can do a sustained fission reaction, which is what you have in our nuclear plants. And you get way more energy out of them than you put into them, which is why they're so profitable and why France uses... Uh, fission reactors for 85 percent of its power and it's it works really well um i was gonna okay so for the current uh nuclear uh yes. power plants that <laughs> nuclear power plants that we have uh powered by fission because as you just mentioned we're discussing fusion we can't 
uh, harness as of yet. Um, we we harness the fission. Uh, in my understanding, so if you've ever seen uh, those, I assume most people listening have probably seen a nuclear power plant before. Nuclear yeah, power any, plants. Anyone who's seen a Godzilla movie. <laughs> right. They have these massive um, columns of steam rising off of the this big uh, cylindrical concrete mass. Right. Um, yes. And so the way, and, and that steam coming off is is the way that we're harnessing that that fission uh, energy is by essentially boiling water and spinning a turbine or something, right? Yeah, I mean that that's pretty much it. The fact that you split an atom in half doesn't immediately equate to electricity. Right. What it equates to is a ridiculous amount of energy, and that energy comes out as heat. Well, the easiest and most efficient way to harness heat is to boil some kind of fluid, either water or whatever fluid of, of your choice you choose to have expand or vaporize or whatever. Use that pressure to then spin a turbine with a magnet attached, which does generate electricity, and that powers your iPhone charger or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, that's more or less how it works. A uh, nuclear reaction causes heat. Heat changes water or some fluid into an expanding vapor, pushes a turbine, generates electricity. Right. And importantly, right now, a lot of people are you know, very much on the green energy bandwagon. And I think as, in as much as we can create green energy, essentially green meaning carbon free or, or very low uh, carbon footprint energy. Yep. Um, nuclear energy has zero carbon footprint uh, right yeah well so it's it's interesting recently one of the founding members of greenpeace actually came out uh strongly in favor of uh adopting more nuclear power because as as far as uh you know its environmental impact goes if handled correctly, if the right fuels are chosen, if the right updated reactor designs are implemented, the nuclear power can be pretty friendly. Um, there are definitely concerns that you deal with in terms of the the byproducts of these reactions. Right, and that's and where things get tricky. Right? They, they do, and the, and the byproducts depend on what fuel you've used and what reaction you're using. Um, you know, we we hear the term nuclear waste. Well, nuclear waste has a bazillion different forms that are more or less unpleasant to be around. Um, and, I mean, it also depends on the type of reactor that you're using, uh, how much waste they generate. Uh, uranium reactors give you some waste that often lasts a very long time. Now, some types of reactors can take that waste and recycle it through them, through themselves, and get more energy out of it. That's cool. Right. Uh, thorium reactors don't have the same types of long-lasting nuclear waste, but they have differently dirty waste. Um, and again, the, the the length and the duration is of, of all these things is a little bit beyond my knowledge and beyond the scope of this podcast. Um, nuclear waste is a thing that does need to be managed, but it very much can be managed if done appropriately and responsibly. And when you look at um, the effort to manage that waste, uh, or, or ba basically the the effort and, and involved in sustaining a safe nuclear cycle from from pulling the fuel out of the ground to to keeping it away from the populations and 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 safely containing disposing or, or recycling it when you look at that environmental impact and you compare it to the environmental impact of many other technologies uh, power technologies including some of the green ones um, well nuclear power seems to begins to look very attractive right um, if you look at you know, for example, and, and I don't want to go too far into this, I, and, and don't take this as me ragging on one technology or another, um, but there there's trade-offs to all of those, any power technology that you, you want to select. For example, if you want to go all solar, well, that's cool, as long as the sun is shining, uh, but the other part of it is consider how many acres of ground you need to cover in solar panels yeah, in got order that. to... Uh, yeah, in order to generate the same electricity 
that you would get from your nuclear power plant. And yeah, I've got a couple that. stats for that. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Okay, so this is from energy.gov. Mm -hmm. um, and so it says, how much power does a nuclear nuclear reactor yes. produce? Yeah, one of those. And it says, uh, so 3.125 million PV panels, so based on the average silicone model panel size of 320 watts. So one nuclear reactor produces as, as much elect, uh, electricity as one uh, 3.125 million panels. It's a significant number of panels. Yeah, and so then it compares to some other things. I mean, it, it kind of, so then wind turbines, yeah. um, uh, it says 431 wind turbines would have to be erected in order to create the same uh, electricity as a nuclear reactor. Um, uh, and then it goes to horsepower, which I don't ent quite understand. Why, why do we keep on shaming the horses? It's not their fault. I don't know. Um, it's, it's because the U.S. refuses to go metric, and we should do an entirely separate <laughs> podcast on that. <laughs> anyway, 1.3 million horses. Uh could uh, generate uh, the uh, n n amount of energy uh, a nuclear a nuclear reactor produces. So okay. I, I see some practicality limitations there. <laughs> uh, well, okay, couple. I would submit that horse waste is no less unpleasant to deal with than nuclear <laughs> waste. Right, right. And so this all comes down to the. So as you're saying, the the, the another page I was on um, research I was doing on this it said. <clears throat> so it's, I guess it comes down to cap the capacity, the energy capacity of these plants. So yeah. nuclear uh, power plants produce it, I guess, what, they, what they call it, a 93.5% capacity factor, um, but, which so that basically means nuclear power plants are producing maximum power for more than 93% of the time during the year. Uh, and so that's one and a half to two times more than natural gas and coal. Yeah. And those are the next closest ones as, as far as like how, how, you know, how much energy they can produce uh, uh, reliably. So solar, wind and hydropower, which are great clean energy sources. And I'm not once again, I'm also not ragging on them, but they don't uh, they're not reliable enough. And they don't at, at capacity. They just don't can't produce the same capacity factor that a nuclear power plant can. Yeah. So, so if if you take that what, out of curiosity, do you have the capacity factor for uh, wind turbine handy? It says 34.8. Okay. So really, and you said it was 430 something wind turbines would equal the power output of one reactor, right? That's correct. So I, I mean, I'm assuming that that is if they are both actually operating at capacity. I'd imagine so as well. So what you probably need to do is take that 38% figure, uh, divide one by it, and multiply that number, basically you still you need roughly two and a half times that number of wind turbines to reliably equal the output of one reactor, uh, which becomes compelling. Now you need over a thousand of these wind turbines. Um, anyway, again, not ragging on any of them some places wind turbines would be absolutely appropriate. I just had a cross country drive from California to Virginia. And as we passed through uh, the great state of Kansas, we're going to lose all of our Kansas listeners here. <laughs> um, you know, we saw wind turbines all over the place. And as I looked at the majestic Kansas landscape, I thought, yep, if ever there was a place <laughs> meant to hold wind turbines, it's here. Right. So it's like, uh, I live in Southern California and, uh, uh, desert uh, spring is it springs anyway uh, just north of us there's hundreds and hundreds and yes given the lovely yeah. landscape there uh, honestly it makes it slightly better yeah so. anyway but yeah uh, okay so going back to, uh, to once again I guess the the so we've talked about a little bit about the process of, of creating um, of what happens in the chemical reaction of uh, nuclear fission and fusion and uh, amount of energy produced and kind of how we harness it, at least currently for fission. Um, uh, the, and the fact that it's green. So it, once again, it come, all comes back to this radio, radioactive waste. And, and that is the big um, reason that it is not as harnessed, uh, at least in our country in the United States. And I guess probably around the world, though, obviously some countries uh, like France have done a better job 
implementing that public policy wise. But um, what can we talk a little bit about how radioactive uh, waste is managed and and what uh, um, what the options are? Uh, I I think that might be a subject for a separate podcast. I'm not really up on this. Okay, well I've got a couple so, things to bring up about that. So go for it. Um, I know that right now France is recycling a lot of its nuclear nuclear fuel. Uh, even so, it uses it in a in a reaction. Um, and then I, once again, I'm also not uh, by any means a nuclear physicist or uh, nuclear plant manager, or I don't have any particular knowledge of how how the recycling process works uh, on a kind of step by step scale scale. But they they take the uh, by the uh, spent nuclear fuel they and they essentially prepare it again for using it uh, in a reactor as fuel again, um, because it turns out that the fission um, process does not actually spend spend all of the fuel that is available um, when it's uh, go, as it goes through that um, that process. So if you essentially uh, can prepare it again appropriately, you can reuse that fuel. Um, not all of it, but a large uh, amount of it. Now, I heard as I was reading about this, I guess some of the concerns about that is that essentially the the byproduct, the the uh, um, radioactive material that it's left over afterwards, recycled fuel, it just essentially gets, continues to get hotter and hotter ra- radioactive wise. Um, and so what you end up with is incredibly radioactive material. Uh, in the end, um, and so managing that can be more challenging. Um, so that is one of the things, but that is one of the options, right? You, you just continue using it, and once it's just radioactive as as any substance can be and still controlled, that's when you kind of end of life it. Uh, and and end of lifing it, I guess, is the problem. Uh, my understanding is, you know, what do you do with it? I know in the United States here, what was it, Matt? Maybe ten years ago, that was that Yucca Mountain. Um, debacle? Uh, I'm not even tracking that one. Oh, okay. Well, then my understanding was the government was trying to procure a a nuclear waste site, a dump site, essentially. And they had drilled into this Yucca Mountain, uh, which I believe is in Nevada, and they were going to just dump used... Dump is an incorrect word, right? It gets prepared. I I think they put it in barrels. Uh, Seems likely. uh, yeah, and 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 then they put it in there for a long time, right? It remains radioactive for a hundred years. I mean, I don't know exactly what what the number is, but I know it is a long time. <clears throat> and but the idea was that if they put it in this mountain, drilled uh, into this mountain, and put it in there, it's protected, and uh, then it can't there can't be nuclear spill waste spill uh, spills and people come in contact with it inadvertently. So, <clears throat> but the problem was that the neighboring communities uh, had, were not fond of that idea um, for, I guess, a couple of main reasons is the transportation of the fuel to the site. Um, and then just the fact that you'd be the community next to the nuclear waste dump ground. Um, so those are a couple that's just, uh, representative, I think, of the kind of issues that you run into uh, public policy-wise when trying to uh, imp- get rid of highly undesirable material. Um, so I guess that's um, the the big question, um, and the other countries have dealt with it in different ways. Um, but once again, like Matt said already, the, the alternative is, is what you have to consider. Um, when, when, so if you're looking at radioactive material and thinking, well, that's, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want my country to deal with that. Uh, so let's, let's take nuclear power off the, off the table. Uh, well, nuclear power has okay. never been on the table. Nuclear, All right. Is it, I uh, will keep doing this. <laughs> anyway, uh, the alternatives are just so poor, uh, from a, from an environmental perspective, from a reliability perspective, from a sustainability perspective, just from so many different perspectives that nuclear power, I mean, 
if you, we fully adopted that. So my, I was reading another article about this. About uh, So I live in California, and I believe that the government in the last 10 years has spent about 100 – I can't verify this number. It was just one article I was reading. But it said something about $100 billion in, in uh, clean energy initiatives. Um, and it said uh, right now between solar and wind, some percentage – I don't have it on me right now, but it's, it's less than 50% – of our total power is generated by those uh, sources. And as we learned last week in California, it's also not particularly reliable. Um, and when and high demand situations come up where we had a huge heat wave, all of a sudden the government's saying, oh, we have to have rolling blackouts. Well, that's not a particularly good uh, outcome from a policy point of view. So uh, when you look at that as the alternative uh, and nuclear power as uh, if they take that same hundred billion dollars and this article said that if they invested that just in nuclear plants, um, we would have enough power uh, to uh, produce, uh, to uh, c cover a hundred percent of California's um, needs now and probably decades into the future. So, um, it's uh, it's such a uh, it scales very well, I guess is the point. Um, and the um, that's why I believe it needs to be uh, better understood. So right. um, well, and yeah, you know, it's it is a again, there's trades for everything. There's no question that nuclear reactors would provide the most energy efficient use of a space and uh, investment dollars in terms of turning that into electricity. Um, but you do have to bounce that off the legitimate concerns of what do you do with the waste? Um, what do you do with in, in terms of providing fuel? Uh, because that fuel is uranium in particular is not particularly easy to find. Thorium is a little bit better. Um, and then um, the other part of that is what do you do when something goes wrong at your reactor? Uh, because if your coal plant catches fire, well, that's bad. Um, that's really bad. But if your nuclear reactor catches fire or gets tsunamied, well, that's potentially catastrophic. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, you know the, that is the trade. Um, now... And, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to go uh, pro-nuclear, anti-nuclear or anything on this. Um, there have been three significant nuclear reactor incidents in history. Um, the, the one in the U.S. at Three Mile Island was significant, not because the reactor melted down, but because um, there was a, actually a release of uh, radioactive vapor in the area in order to prevent the meltdown uh, and after that procedures were, were were changed such such that the united states has never even come close to having another uh, incident like that the the uh the really bad ones were in russia or rather ukraine uh the chernobyl okay. nuclear reactor incident that one was a, a partial meltdown and that one was truly catastrophic uh and it was caused by poor training, poor procedures, poor implementation, poor everything. It was just poor. And um, because of that, uh, you know, I, I spent two years in Romania uh, as a missionary. And while I was over there, we were given water filters that had three chambers. And the third chamber was a radiation filter because poor Romania was downriver from Chernobyl. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, so they're still dealing with that. And then the third uh, nuclear incident was the Fukushima reactor that was damaged during the 2011 tsunami in Japan. Um, the Japanese did everything right, but, you know, sometimes nature just strikes in the wrong place. Uh, okay. And so all of these things are some of the drawbacks to nuclear fission power. Um, see what I did here? I set up a segue, which is why <laughs> nuclear fusion power is seen by many as, as the ideal uh, 
way ahead for the future, kind of the holy grail for energy generation, uh, if it can be achieved. Which is the big if, because my understanding from talking to our dad is that it was back in the 60s, they were pretty sure they'd have a nuclear uh, reactor, a nuclear generator, whatever fusion. they call them. Fusion. A fusion. Reactor fusion reactor or within you know five to ten years and yep. that's all it's and, and that horizon has main has been maintained at that level for the last you know 60 years yes so yeah um, yeah um there, there is continuing progress towards it uh as i mentioned we are able to do nuclear fusion um but right now it consumes more energy than it generates um uh, but we're advancing um there is a big project in europe uh it, it's basically a europe-wide um it's, it's even bigger than europe it's a major international consortium um and they're working to develop a uh a functional fusion reactor um and and you can look it up if you go to iter.org Iter, iter, I don't know. Uh, you can learn all about this um, this fusion reactor that is being built, or this fusion reactor project that is being built by this uh, multinational consortium. Uh, and and even that, you know, going into it eyes open, they don't predict uh, reasonable power generation for another decade or so. Uh, but they're trying to advance towards it, and that's a good good thing. Uh, if we could get to the point where you can do a sustainable nuclear fusion reaction, you eliminate a lot of the drawbacks to a fission reactor. Uh, that said, fusion is hard. Um, in order to do fusion, you have you, there's 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 three parameters that you have to kind of have come together in in this one grand equation um, so those three parameters are temperature pressure and what is known as confinement time um, and, and and basically what it comes down to is it, w when you do fusion it's it's imagine that you're forcing two magnets uh, together when they're oriented so that they're repelling each other uh, if you've tried to do that you know that you can do it but you have a significant magnetic force to overcome. And the bigger the magnet, the stronger that magnetic force. Well, it turns out it's the same with atoms and atomic nuclei, nucleuses. Um, if you have large atoms with a nucleus with a large number of protons, trying to smash that into another nucleus with a large number of protons is very difficult. Uh, that's why fusion tends to use very small atoms, uh, atoms with only one or two protons, hydrogen kind of being the fuel of choice. Hydrogen is just a single proton. Um, so you can kind of overcome that repelling force. And when they get close enough together, uh, a different natural force takes over, and those two protons will smush, smush into each other and fuse to create a helium nucleus. Um, if, if you can get that to happen, that's great. But in order to create the environment where that can happen, you need very high energy levels. That means high pressure, and, or rather high temperature. You need to keep them compressed so that they are being pressed into each other rather than escaping off into the void. So that means high pressure. And you need to give it sufficient time for this reaction to take place without bleeding away all of its energy, all of that heat that you're putting into it. Uh, and so that's your confinement time. You need to maintain that high pressure, high temperature environment for sufficient time for the reactions to take place. If you can do those three things, then you can generate a fusion reaction. And we've done it, and that's great. And if you can do those three things using less energy than you get out of your fusion reaction, then you have a reactor that is commercially viable and profitable and can be used uh, to power humanity for the future. 
um, that's where we're at. We're trying to get those three things, temperature, pressure, and confinement time, while using less energy than we get out of the reaction. So far, we haven't succeeded, except with bombs. But right. that's well, the sun succeeded a long time ago. You know, and that is interesting, because if we had a sun, then we'd be set. Unfortunately, the only sun that we do have is the sun that you can't really hook a turbine up to. Can you? Uh, well, the closest we've got is hooking a solar panel up to it. So in a way, a solar panel is making use of a nuclear fusion reaction, because that is what the sun is. Right. The sun is a constant self-sustaining fusion reaction, where at the sun's core, you have a whole bunch of hydrogen that is under immense pressure, you know, because it's at the center of the sun. It's at immense temperature, again, te center of the sun. It's got all the confinement time you need because it's not going anywhere. And so it's able to fuse all over the place. And that's great. Um, Again, the only suns that we have been able to recreate on Earth have been those bombs that I keep mentioning, <laughs> and that's a little bit harder to hook up to a turbine. A little so, bit. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, fusion is pretty awesome. Um, I uh, There is cold fusion, which I don't think we want to necessarily get into too much, largely because I don't know nothing about it. Um, I well, do know that... Yeah, the, the idea is that... As I understand it, this is the super layman here because I don't know much. I mentioned you need the three things of high temperature, high pressure, and confinement time. Well, supposedly, theoretically, if you just have the high pressure and the confinement time, you might be able to get those reactions without doing the temperature piece, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, well, that would make sense given the name cold. Yeah. Fusion. Or, or at least do the temperature piece in a different way. So, yeah. <laughs> because re you're, regardless, you're still going to need to excite atoms, and exciting atoms by its definition is going to generate heat. So right. whatever. I, I don't really know why they call it cold fusion. Neither do I. But I do know the, the funny story about the uh, University of Utah back in, was that the 70s? Oh, uh, yeah. They, they, they claimed uh, that they had uh, achieved cold fusion and it yeah. was published in a major scientific magazine i believe or at least it went out in the news reports even if it wasn't published in a, and so there was massive media right away um about this and it turns out that they were of course incorrect they had not actually achieved cold fusion it was, I don't know if it was a measurement error um well, i don't remember what exactly the scenario was but it was certainly an embarrassment for the university um which i can appreciate given they were our rivals in my, the university that I went to. So. Yeah. Well, one of the big problems with that thing uh, was that it really jaded a lot of people um, to the idea that fusion could be a thing. And so right after that, a lot of the government investment in fusion went away. And so that error actually set fusion development back for i you know many years mm. kind of sad that is the story is don't publish your results before they get peer reviewed <laughs> <laughs> that is a good moral okay so uh two other things before we wrap up the podcast um first i was going to give an update on our listener base because i find it interesting even if nobody else does uh australia has been maintaining a lead for a while in our non-us listeners um Australia, Canada's coming up strong, so you need to you need to kick it into gear. Uh, the Canadians are coming on strong here, and surprisingly, Singapore has uh, all of a sudden decided that uh, our layman knowledge is also sufficiently interesting. So um, this is um, um, and the UK, they're just kind of kicking around. They don't really do anything. Um, I appreciate you, you British and um, other UK residents. Um, anyway, once again, interesting to me, uh, but uh, the US audience still representing well. Obviously, we're American, so that could be expected. Um, okay, 
after that, the other thing, uh, so Matt, you said you wanted to go on record of not necessarily for being a proponent of one particular type of energy over another. And generally, if you learn it from a layman, we try to just present what we believe is fact, at least, and some hopefully research and or scientific ideas um, besides the few podcasts that we've done that are far, far more opinion based. But um, in this case, I would like to also cite the fact that it, when considering, you know, different energy types, safety being the big drawback potentially of, of nuclear reactions, fission being the only one that we can currently use. Um, uh, looking through the Wikipedia page, it says, in terms of lives lost per unit of energy generated, nuclear power has caused fewer accidental deaths per unit of energy generated than all other major sources of energy generation. Uh, Is that combined? I don't know. It didn't have the word combined at the end, so I don't know. Um, and that's that's that taking the consideration. Yeah, so that's taking into consideration, like, I believe Chernobyl and Fukushima uh, still. It says Actually, following. Wait, no, that doesn't make sense. Because if you combine it, you'd have a bigger number of lives lost, and then it would be easier for nukes to get under it. Never mind. De no, delete right. that question. Good point. Yeah. So any, <laughs> well, any other, uh, it, it is basically the safest in terms of um, life endangerment for watt of power generated. That's correct. And and, and to be fair, they're, they're talking about... Um, they're ge they're generating these numbers based on like air pollution um, yep. and uh, other accidents as well. So air pollution obviously does shorten. So uh, it says following the tw 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster it has been estimated that if Japan had never adopted nuclear power, accidents and pollution from coal or gas plants would have caused more lost years of life. Yeah, no, that so. absolutely does not surprise me. Um, and, and, I mean, there, there's going to be risk to any human endeavor, uh, and there's it, it can be managed, it can be mitigated, it can be reduced, but there will always be some level of risk. Uh, personally, I, I would call myself a proponent of nuclear power. I think it's the way to go. I think it's the safest uh, and, and most economical way to provide power to humanity um, all, all over the world. Uh, and it can get power into places where it would otherwise be very difficult. Um, that said, you know, it needs to be handled responsibly, intelligently, educatedly, um, with a little more care and, and, and thought than you would get from even from listening to this podcast. <laughs> um, but there, I, I do see massive benefits for, for mankind as a, as a whole. Uh, you know, with the the fission reactors that we have now, and the and the potential promise of uh, fusion power in the future, uh, I I think I, I think it's a great way to go. Yeah. Um, oh, what was that? I had uh, one other thing. Oh yeah, nuclear power. Uh, it's also uh, one of the few things that works in space. Uh, mm. Sort of. Uh, NASA has used uh, not exactly nuclear power, but uh, nuclear. Well, they they've used um, uh, radioactive materials uh, that you would find in in nuclear scenarios to power some of their deep space probes. Uh, you know, most spacecraft run off solar panels. Well, as you get farther from the sun, solar panels don't work. So if you're sending deep space probes out to Pluto or something like that, you need a power source that's going to last for the 50 whatever years it takes for your your craft to get out there. And so uh, they use nuclear reactions and, and atomic reactions to power their those deep space probes because they're the only things that'll work. So. Yeah. There are a lot of a lot of upsides, and you know, with all the energy um, research that's being done, um, it more needs to be uh, look. You know, the more that even the layman, such as myself, and or any other of our listeners who may be more or less lay than myself, uh, the more that we learn about nuclear and uh, reactions and power generation. Um, and, and the general population, the more comfortable we're going to be with it and or the more 
more input we're going to have uh, and uh, the more we're going to want to hear from uh, our leaders about you know, what what is being done and why energy of particular sources is being prioritized over potentially more efficient sources like nuclear energy. So uh, that is, uh, I think, the, the end of uh, the discussion here, Matt. Any other scientific tidbits that we need to add, Matt, about uh, fission or fusion? Uh, no, I think we've covered everything that the layman needs to know. Okay, good. So. That, uh, that sounds about right. Tim, you clearly jumped on here at the end to make a very useful addition. Um, you must have solved fusion while you were not on here. Uh, how did you know? <laughs> well, California is really hot, so I assume that was why. <laughs> Sorry, Arizona is really hot. Well, yeah, I mean, the trick is you have to have three microwaves. What? And just, yeah, just one it, inside. It's kind of complex. Show. I'll have to explain it next time. Okay. But uh, in the meantime, if you want to get in on the ground floor on this groundbreaking technology, just send me $100, $500, or $1,000. Okay. Right. <laughs> I just wanted anyway. to say that I agree with everything that you guys said in this podcast. <laughs> Good. I'm glad that you have made a very meaningful addition to this uh, scientific podcast. Thanks, Tim. Uh, but for now, we're going to sign off. We're going to say uh, go out and uh, you know do the research. Or, and if you are have been convinced by our discussion of nuclear reactions, both from the chemical level all the way up to you know byproducts and and management, uh, you know contact your local uh, government officials and ask them about uh, energy sources in your area. So go out and make a difference and we'll see you back again next episode.